Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. Thank you, Andrew, for everything you've done, for the teachings that you do. It has affected every area of our life, my wife and our marriage, our kids, our business. So I just want to say thank you to you. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my third week teaching on the true nature of God. And I tell you, I've covered a lot of material. There's just no way I can go back and summarize it all, but we do have some materials that we're offering. We not only have this book that I wrote a long time ago. Actually, this is the Spanish version of that book. Here is the English version on the true nature of God. And this is one of the foundational teachings uh, that I put out 30 or 40 years ago. And my staff just came up with this little introduction to the true nature of God. This is a free gift to you. It's just a brief summary of this teaching. And we are offering that as our free gift to you. And then we also have CDs and DVDs. But there's no way I can go back and summarize everything. If you've missed any of this, please go to our website and look at this uh, teaching in its entirety or get the materials that we're offering because this is just foundational stuff that every single person needs to know. So basically, I've been saying that the Lord has been maligned. He's been misrepresented. He's been, uh, I mean, He's been defamed and things are said about Him that are absolutely not true. And if you accept those things, it's going to hinder you in your relationship with Him. Also, uh, we need to know the truth about God and His nature because then you won't be susceptible to the lies that Satan is putting out. You know, if you know the truth, the truth sets you free. But the sad fact is a lot of people have misunderstanding. They don't know the truth about who God really is. So that's the reason I've been teaching on this. And one of the things I've been focused on for the last week is that it's the law that has given people a misunderstanding of who God really is. Not because the law was incorrect. The law was just and holy and it's true. But religion has misinterpreted why God gave the law. They thought that God gave the law so that we could keep it and proportional to how well we fulfilled all of the requirements of the law, then God would accept us. That's not true. The reason God gave the law was to, first of all, show us what His standard of right and wrong was because it had been so misrepresented that people thought it was okay for them to do all kinds of things that were not right in the sight of God. So one of the purposes was to show us what the true standard of right and wrong, holiness and sin is. But then the second purpose of the law, the primary function of the law was to bring us to a place to where we despaired of trying to earn God's goodness through our actions. And we just said, God, if this is what you demand, if you demand this standard of perfection, I can never do it. God have mercy on me, a sinner. And that is the reason that God gave this law. You know, I've quoted this a number of times, but let me just turn over and read this out of Galatians chapter 3. And it says in verse 22, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. The law was to shut us up, to take away all avenues of approaching God that you just, whatever direction you headed, there was a law condemning you and you move this direction, there's a law condemning you and it just shut you up so that you had nowhere to look but up. It says in the next verse, wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. It says in verse 24 that the law was a schoolmaster. Now we are no longer under the schoolmaster. We are no longer under the law. And people who don't understand this, they think that God demands this level of perfection that none of us can approach to. And so they don't doubt God's ability or God's miraculous power. They just doubt that God will use that power on their behalf because their own heart condemns them that they haven't been as holy and as pure as they should be. 
I tell you, I just said a mouthful there. And so the last couple of days, what I was doing was going through the book of Hebrews, and we were in Hebrews chapter 9, where it talked about all of these pieces of the uh, tabernacle or the temple, and it talked about all of them, except when it came to the cherubims, it says we can't talk about those particularly now. The reason is because the cherubims were there to keep people from coming directly into the presence of God because they were unholy and they were unworthy. And so the cherubims were there and they would literally strike people dead if anybody tried to enter the Holy of Holies. Uh, the only person that could go in was the high priest and he could only go in one time a year after he had done all of these uh, sacrifices and purification rituals. And if anybody tried to enter in, they'd be struck dead. That was the job of the cherubim. But now, the way unto the Holy of Holies, the way un directly unto God is open unto us through the body of the Lord Jesus. So that's what these verses were talking about. In verse 6, this is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 6. It says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So this is talking about under the old covenant, People did not have access to God freely, which we do under the New Covenant. I gave some of those verses yesterday. We'll be dealing with that more on our programs next week. In Hebrews 9, 9, it says, which was a figure. This is talking about that first tabernacle was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. Now, there's going to be a number of things said. Let me just preface it by saying that there are going to be many, many statements in chapter 9 and chapter 10 about the Old Testament was only temporary and it only worked until Jesus came and fulfilled all of the symbolism and all of the rituals of the Old Testament. Now that we are in the New Covenant, we don't have to go by this Old Testament symbolism and ritualism anymore. Now, that's good news, but yet religious people get offended by this because, again, they've tried to mix the Old and the New Covenant together to make them represent God as this harsh, angry person who has been atoned by the uh, uh, sacrifice of Jesus, but, I mean, he's just very close to being ticked off, and we have to really hide behind Jesus because God the Father would be upset with us. That is not what these things are saying. The wrath of God has been totally satisfied. You know, I am going to get into these verses, but let me turn over and use this verse out of John chapter 12 to uh, try and illustrate the point that I'm making. In John chapter 12, Jesus was speaking and defending His authority, and people were challenging Him once again. This is in John chapter 12, and in verse 27, he says, Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Man, what a great prayer. Jesus was facing death. He was facing not only physical death, but spiritually he was facing being separated from God and becoming sin for us. And he just abhorred becoming sin. But what was he going to pray? Just what was good for him? No, he said, God, I want you to be glorified. And he knew that it was God's will that he become the lamb that takes away the sins of the world. So he prayed this unselfish prayer that, God, I want you to be glorified, even if that means my death and my suffering. And it says, Then there came a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said that it thundered. Others said an angel spake to him. You know, this is amazing to me. They heard the audible voice of God, and yet some people wrote it off as being thunder. Other people thought it was an angel. This just illustrates 
THAT DID YOU KNOW THE MIRACULOUS POWER OF GOD DOESN'T CONVINCE ANYBODY. FAITH COMES BY HEARING, AND HEARING BY THE WORD OF GOD. AND IF YOU HAVE A HEART TO SEEK GOD AND TO BE OPEN TO GOD, WELL, THEN MIRACLES WILL JUST CONFIRM AND ESTABLISH AND VERIFY THE THINGS THAT THE WORD OF GOD WAS TEACHING. BUT IF YOU HAVE A HEART THAT'S HARDENED TOWARDS GOD, EVEN IF YOU HEARD AN AUDIBLE VOICE OUT OF HEAVEN, YOU WOULD FIND SOME EXCUSE TO SAY, WELL, IT WAS JUST THUNDER. THAT WASN'T A VOICE. I'VE SEEN THIS. I'VE SEEN PEOPLE RAISED FROM THE DEAD. I'VE SEEN GREAT MIRACLES HAPPEN. AND PEOPLE WHO ALREADY WERE TRUSTING AND BELIEVING GOD, BUT MAYBE THEY WERE JUST STRUGGLING AND NEEDED SOME ENCOURAGEMENT. BOY, THAT JUST PUSHES THEM OVER THE EDGE AND HELPS THEM TO BELIEVE. BUT PEOPLE WHO ARE ALREADY HARDENED AGAINST GOD, THEY WON'T BELIEVE THEY'LL ro SOMEBODY ROSE FROM THE DEAD. YOU CAN SEE THAT WITH LAZARUS BEING RAISED FROM THE DEAD IN THE 11TH CHAPTER OF THE BOOK OF JOHN. AND SOME OF THE PEOPLE WHO SAW HIM COME OUT OF THE GRAVE AFTER HE'D BEEN DEAD FOR FOUR DAYS, THEY IMMEDIATELY WENT TO THE SCRIBES AND PHARISEES AND PLOTTED HOW THEY COULD NOT ONLY KILL JESUS, BUT KILL LAZARUS AGAIN. MAN, THAT'S AMAZING TO ME, BUT IT REALLY SHOWS THAT FAITH DOESN'T JUST COME FROM THE OUTSIDE. IT DOESN'T COME BY BEING FORCED INTO SOMETHING. YOU HAVE TO HAVE A HEART TO BELIEVE, AND IF YOUR HEART IS HARDENED TOWARDS GOD, THEN YOU'RE GOING TO FIND SOME WAY TO EXCUSE AND TO WRITE OFF THE MIRACULOUS POWER OF GOD. THAT'S WHAT THESE PEOPLE DID. AND JESUS ANSWERED AND SAID UNTO THEM, THIS VOICE CAME NOT BECAUSE OF ME, BUT FOR YOUR SAKES. IN OTHER WORDS, HE'S SAYING, I DIDN'T NEED GOD TO SPEAK TO ME IN AN AUDIBLE VOICE. HE WAS IN COMMUNION WITH GOD THROUGH HIS SPIRIT, AND HE WAS RECEIVING DIRECTION DIRECTLY FROM HIS HEAVENLY FATHER THROUGH HIS SPIRIT. BUT it, THE VOICE CAME FOR THE OTHER PEOPLE, AND YET SOME OF THEM REJECTED IT. AND THEN HE SAID IN VERSE 31, NOW IS THE JUDGMENT OF THIS WORLD. NOW SHALL THE PRINCE OF THIS WORLD BE CAST OUT. AND I, IF I BE LIFTED UP FROM THE EARTH, WILL DRAW ALL MEN UNTO ME. DID YOU KNOW THAT THAT 32ND VERSE IS TYPICALLY INTERPRETED AS IF WE JUST PRESENT JESUS PROPERLY, IF WE GLORIFY HIM AND PREACH THE WORD PROPERLY, HE WILL DRAW ALL MEN UNTO HIM. AND THAT IS NOT WHAT THIS VERSE MEANS. I CAN GUARANTEE YOU TODAY, YOU CAN LOOK AT SOME OF THE LARGEST CHURCHES, THE MEGA CHURCHES, NOT ALL OF THEM, BUT MANY OF THEM, THE REASON THEY HAVE SO MANY PEOPLE THERE IS BECAUSE THEY HAVE COMPROMISED THE WORD OF GOD. AND THEY ARE NOT TRULY GLORIFYING GOD PROPERLY. YOU CAN DRAW PEOPLE WITH, with SHOWS AND WITH BELLS AND WHISTLES AND THE SMOKE AND THE STROBE LIGHTS AND ALL OF THE THINGS. I'M NOT GOING TO MENTION NAMES, BUT ONE OF THE MEN WHO MADE THE SEEKER-FRIENDLY CHURCH POPULAR. BY HIS OWN ADMISSION, HE WAS THE LEADER OF IT, AND HE DID IT BECAUSE HE WANTED TO DRAW MORE PEOPLE, AND HE JUST ASSUMED THAT IF HE COULD GET THEM TO COME TO CHURCH, THAT SOMEHOW OR ANOTHER BY JUST OSMOSIS OR SOMETHING, THEY WOULD uh, DEVELOP INTO TRUE BELIEVERS AND DISCIPLES. AND AFTER DECADES OF DOING THIS AND DRAWING, I MEAN TENS OF THOUSANDS OF PEOPLE, THIS MAN WHO WAS A LEADER IN THAT SAID THAT HE MADE A MISTAKE AND THAT HE HAD DRAWN PEOPLE, BUT THEY WERE NOT TRUE CONVERTS AND THEY WERE NOT TRUE DISCIPLES. Uh, HE HAD FAILED IN THAT THING. SO uh, ANYWAY, MANY OF THESE MEGA CHURCHES ARE DRAWING PEOPLE, BUT IT'S NOT BECAUSE THEY'RE TRULY GLORIFYING GOD. THIS ISN'T TALKING ABOUT THAT IF YOU JUST PREACH CORRECTLY THAT GOD WILL DRAW LARGE NUMBERS OF PEOPLE TO YOU. WHAT THIS IS SAYING, IF YOU LOOK AT THAT 32ND VERSE, THE WORD MAN IS ITALICIZED. WHAT THIS MEANS IS, IN THE KING JAMES TRANSLATION, ONE OF THE REASONS THAT I LIKE THE KING JAMES, THERE'S MANY REASONS, BUT ONE OF THEM IS THAT WHEN THEY PUT A WORD IN TO TRY AND GIVE CLARITY TO THE TRANSLATION, THEY WOULD ITALICIZE IT. THEY WOULD LET YOU KNOW THAT THIS ISN'T IN THE ORIGINAL LANGUAGE, BUT IN ORDER FOR US TO MAKE THE POINT, WE PUT THIS WORD IN, AND THEY WOULD BE HONEST ENOUGH TO LET YOU KNOW, AND IT'S ITALICIZED IN THE KING JAMES BIBLE. SO WHAT THIS IS LITERALLY SAYING, HE SAYS, it, AND I, IF I BE LIFTED UP, WILL DRAW ALL UNTO ME. ALL WHAT? WELL, THEY JUST FIGURED IT WAS TALKING ABOUT ALL MEN. BUT IF YOU LOOK AT IT IN CONTEXT, IN THE 31ST VERSE, THE SUBJECT WAS, NOW IS THE JUDGMENT OF THIS WORLD. NOW SHALL THE PRINCE OF THIS WORLD BE CAST OUT. AND I BELIEVE IN VERSE 32 WHEN HE SAYS, AND I, IF I BE LIFTED UP, WILL DRAW ALL. I BELIEVE HE WAS TALKING ABOUT ALL OF THAT JUDGMENT UNTO HIM. AND THIS IS VERIFIED IN THE NEXT VERSE. IN THE NEXT VERSE IT SAYS, THIS HE SAID, SIGNIFYING WHAT DEATH HE SHOULD DIE. HE WASN'T TALKING ABOUT PREACHING HIM PROPERLY AND THAT HE WOULD DRAW ALL MEN UNTO HIM. HE WAS TALKING ABOUT BEING CRUCIFIED, 
PUT UP ON THE TREE, LIFTED UP ON THE CROSS, AND WHEN THAT HAPPENED, ALL OF GOD'S JUDGMENT, ALL OF GOD'S WRATH WOULD COME UPON HIM. BOY, THAT IS AMAZING. WHEN JESUS WAS CRUCIFIED AND LIFTED UP ON THAT CROSS, GOD PUT HIS WRATH AND HIS JUDGMENT AGAINST YOUR SIN AND MY SIN INTO JESUS. AND JESUS LITERALLY BECAME SIN FOR US. 2 CORINTHIANS 5.21 SAYS, FOR HE HATH MADE HIM TO BE MADE SIN WHO KNEW NO SIN THAT WE MIGHT BE MADE THE RIGHTEOUSNESS OF GOD IN HIM. JESUS DIDN'T JUST TASTE A LITTLE BIT OF SIN. HE DIDN'T JUST HAVE A SYMBOLIC AMOUNT OF SIN PLACED ON HIM. JESUS BECAME SIN. HE DIDN'T JUST HAVE SIN. HE BECAME SIN. THAT'S AMAZING. IT'S AMAZING THAT GOD ALMIGHTY WOULD COME TO THIS EARTH AND BE A MAN AND SUFFER AND THEN BE CRUCIFIED. AND THOSE THINGS ARE BAD ENOUGH. BUT TO THINK THAT HE LITERALLY TOOK ALL OF THE SIN OF THE HUMAN RACE, EVERY PERVERSION, EVERY SEXUAL SIN, ALL OF THE MURDER, ALL OF THE TERRIBLE LYING AND STEALING, JESUS BECAME ALL OF THOSE THINGS. AND HE DIDN'T JUST DO IT IN PRINCIPLE. HE LITERALLY BECAME SIN FOR US. THIS IS THE REASON THAT ON THE CROSS HE SAYS, MY GOD, MY GOD, WHY HAVE YOU FORSAKEN ME? DO YOU KNOW THAT'S A QUOTATION FROM PSALMS CHAPTER 22. IT WAS PROPHESIED THAT HE WOULD SAY THIS. AND THE NEXT VERSE IN PSALMS 22 TELLS YOU WHY GOD FORSOOK HIM. IT'S BECAUSE IN THE NEXT VERSE SAYS, BUT THOU ART HOLY, O GOD, WHICH INHABITS THE PRAISES OF ISRAEL. YOU KNOW WHY GOD FORSOOK JESUS? BECAUSE HE BECAME SIN. AND THIS WAS THE JUDGMENT. THIS WAS THE PUNISHMENT FOR SIN, DEATH, SEPARATION FROM GOD. AND JESUS BECAME SEPARATED FROM HIS HEAVENLY FATHER. HE WAS FORSAKEN BECAUSE THAT'S WHAT YOU AND I DESERVE. WE DESERVE TO BE FORSAKEN AND JUDGED. AND THIS IS WHAT HE'S REFERRING TO. AND I, WHEN I'M LIFTED UP, ALL OF GOD'S JUDGMENT, NOT SOME OF IT, NOT JUST A TOKEN AMOUNT OF JUDGMENT, BUT THE WRATH OF GOD AGAINST THE SIN OF THE ENTIRE HUMAN RACE FELL UPON JESUS ON THE CROSS. AND HE WAS FORSAKEN BY GOD. AND I TELL YOU, IF YOU TRULY UNDERSTAND WHAT THAT MEANS, THAT ALL OF HIS JUDGMENT, ALL OF IT, THAT MEANS THAT THERE ISN'T ANY LEFT. GOD'S NOT MAD AT YOU. GOD'S NOT MAD AT ME FOR OUR SINS. HE'S PAID FOR THE SINS OF THE WHOLE WORLD. AND 1 JOHN CHAPTER 2, VERSE 2 SAYS, HE IS THE PROPITIATION. THAT MEANS THE ATONING SACRIFICE. THAT'S TALKING ABOUT HIS CRUCIFIXION AND BECOMING SIN FOR US. HE'S THE PROPITIATION FOR OUR SINS, AND NOT FOR OURS ONLY, BUT ALSO FOR THE SINS OF THE WHOLE WORLD. JESUS DIDN'T JUST DIE FOR THE PEOPLE HE KNEW WOULD ACCEPT HIM. HE DIED FOR THE PEOPLE THAT HE KNEW WOULD REJECT HIM. HE PAID FOR THEIR SINS. NOW, THAT DOESN'T MEAN THAT THEIR SINS ARE TOTALLY WIPED OUT BECAUSE IF THEY REJECT THE PAYMENT THAT WAS MADE, THEN THEY WILL HAVE TO ANSWER TO GOD FOR THAT REJECTION. SO I'M NOT SAYING THAT EVERYBODY IS SAVED, BUT EVERYBODY HAS HAD THEIR SINS ATONED FOR. THE PAYMENT HAS BEEN MADE, AND JESUS PAID FOR THE SINS OF THE ENTIRE WORLD. MAN, THAT'S AWESOME. HE'S ALREADY PAID FOR YOUR SINS AND MY SINS. WE DON'T HAVE TO DO SOMETHING TO APPEASE AN ANGRY GOD. HE HAS BEEN APPEASED THROUGH WHAT JESUS DID. AND ALL WE HAVE TO DO IS BELIEVE AND RECEIVE WHAT JESUS DID, OR IF WE DOUBT, WE DO WITHOUT. WE, we WILL HAVE TO ANSWER FOR OUR OWN SINS. WE WILL HAVE TO ANSWER FOR THE SIN OF REJECTING JESUS, THE PAYMENT FOR OUR SINS. BUT ALL OF THE SIN HAS BEEN PAID FOR. AND THIS IS WHAT THESE VERSES HERE IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 IS TALKING ABOUT. IT WAS IMPOSSIBLE THAT AN ANIMAL COULD EVER TAKE AWAY THE SINS OF THE WORLD. BUT WHAT THE ANIMALS COULDN'T DO, JESUS, THE LAMB OF GOD, THE PERFECT, SINLESS SON OF GOD, TOOK YOUR SIN AND MY SIN INTO HIS OWN BODY AND DIED SO THAT ALL WE HAVE TO DO, WE DON'T HAVE TO PERFORM NOW AND KEEP ALL OF THE LAWS AND DO EVERYTHING JUST RIGHT FOR GOD TO ACCEPT US. GOD ACCEPTS US BASED ON WHAT JESUS DID FOR US. AND ALL JESUS SAID THAT WE HAVE TO DO IS JUST BELIEVE AND RECEIVE. 
IF WE WILL MAKE HIM OUR LORD, IF WE WILL SUBMIT AND RECEIVE SALVATION AS A GIFT THROUGH JESUS, THEN WE ARE TREATED JUST AS IF WE HAD NEVER SINNED, JUSTIFIED JUST AS IF I HAD NEVER SINNED. THAT'S NEARLY TOO GOOD TO BE TRUE NEWS, BUT THAT'S WHAT THE GOSPEL IS. AND SO IT SAYS IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 AND IN VERSE 11, BUT CHRIST BEING COME A HIGH PRIEST OF GOOD THINGS TO COME BY A GREATER AND A MORE PERFECT TABERNACLE, NOT MADE WITH HANDS, THAT IS TO SAY, NOT OF THIS BUILDING, NEITHER BY THE BLOOD OF GOATS AND CALVES, BUT BY HIS OWN BLOOD HE ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE, HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. AND I'M RUNNING SHORT OF TIME TODAY, BUT I WILL GET INTO THIS IN MORE DETAIL ON OUR PROGRAMS NEXT WEEK. BUT HERE IN HEBREWS CHAPTER 9 AND CHAPTER 10, IT'S CONTRASTING THE WAY THINGS WERE DONE UNDER THE OLD COVENANT LAW AND THE WAY THINGS ARE DONE UNDER THE NEW COVENANT GRACE. AND ONE OF THE MAJOR CONTRAST THAT HE'S MAKING IS THAT UNDER THE OLD COVENANT, YOU HAD TO OFFER A SACRIFICE FOR SIN EVERY SINGLE TIME YOU SINNED. AND THEN ON THE DAY OF ATONEMENT, THE HIGH PRIEST OFFERED A SACRIFICE FOR THE SINS OF THE ENTIRE NATION JUST IN CASE THEY HAD MISSED SOMETHING. SO THERE WAS JUST CONSTANT AWARENESS OF SIN AND OFFERING FOR SINS CONSTANTLY. BUT UNDER THE NEW COVENANT, HERE IN VERSE 12, CHRIST ENTERED IN ONCE INTO THE HOLY PLACE, HAVING OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION FOR US. AND I THINK THAT THERE'S FOUR OR FIVE TIMES HERE IN THE NINTH CHAPTER OF HEBREWS THAT IT MAKES THIS CONTRAST BETWEEN THE OLD COVENANT AND THE NEW COVENANT THAT INSTEAD OF MANY SACRIFICES FOR SINS, ONE SACRIFICE FOR SINS DEALT WITH YOUR SINS FOREVER. THAT'S AMAZING. THAT IS A HUGE DIFFERENCE. AND YET THE AVERAGE CHRISTIAN TODAY STILL BELIEVES THAT EVERY TIME THEY SIN, IT'S A BRAND NEW TRANSGRESSION AGAINST GOD, AND THEY'VE GOT TO GO TO GOD AND GET THAT SIN FORGIVEN AND UNDER THE BLOOD. AND IF THEY DON'T, IF THEY WERE TO LIVE WITH AN UNCONFESSED SIN IN THEIR LIFE, THEN AGAIN, LIKE I SAID EARLIER IN THE WEEK, THE EXTREME INTERPRETATION IS YOU LOSE YOUR SALVATION EVERY TIME THERE'S AN UNCONFESSED SIN, AND IF YOU WERE TO DIE IN THAT STATE, YOU WOULD GO TO HELL. OR THE SAME PRINCIPLE, JUST A LESSER CONSEQUENCE IS THAT YOU DON'T LOSE YOUR SALVATION, BUT YOU'LL LOSE ALL OF THE BENEFITS OF YOUR SALVATION. GOD WON'T FELLOWSHIP WITH YOU. HE WON'T ANSWER YOUR PRAYER. HE WON'T USE YOU IF YOU HAVE ANY UNCONFESSED SIN IN YOUR LIFE. AND SO THEY HAVE TO CONSTANTLY, EVERY TIME THEY SIN, DEAL WITH THAT AS IF IT'S A BRAND NEW TRANSGRESSION THAT HAS SEPARATED THEM FROM GOD. BUT THIS SAYS THAT JESUS ONE TIME ENTERED IN AND OBTAINED ETERNAL REDEMPTION, NOT MOMENTARY REDEMPTION UNTIL THE NEXT TIME YOU SIN, BUT ETERNAL REDEMPTION, PAST, PRESENT, AND EVEN THE SINS YOU HAVEN'T COMMITTED YET. MAN, I KNOW THAT THAT'S RADICAL. I KNOW SOME PEOPLE ARE THINKING, WHAT ARE YOU SAYING? YOU NEED TO TUNE IN NEXT WEEK SO THAT I CAN EXPLAIN THIS. OR YOU CAN GET OUR BOOK, THE TRUE NATURE OF GOD, OR I HAVE CD'S AND DVD'S WHERE I GO INTO MORE DETAIL ON THIS. AND ALSO, MY STAFF PUT TOGETHER, THEY TOOK MY TEACHING AND BASICALLY JUST SUMMARIZED SOME OF THE THINGS THAT ARE IN THIS BOOK. THIS IS A LITTLE PAMPHLET THAT'S JUST A BRIEF INTRODUCTION OR SUMMARY TO THE TEACHING ON THE TRUE NATURE OF GOD. THIS IS A TOTAL FREE GIFT TO YOU. LISTEN TO OUR ANNOUNCER AND PLEASE CALL OR WRITE TODAY. ANDREW IS OFFERING HIS BOOKLET, THE TRUE NATURE OF GOD, AS HIS FREE GIFT TO YOU TODAY. THIS OFFER IS LIMITED TO ONE FREE BOOKLET PER HOUSEHOLD AND IS AVAILABLE IN THE U.S., U.K., CANADA, AND AUSTRALIA. CONTACT US TODAY TO RECEIVE YOUR FREE BOOKLET. ANDREW'S COMPLETE SERIES, THE TRUE NATURE OF GOD, IS AVAILABLE IN A CD OR DVD ALBUM AND AS A BOOK IN EITHER ENGLISH OR SPANISH. EACH OF THESE RESOURCES IS AVAILABLE FOR A GIFT OF ANY AMOUNT WHEN YOU CONTACT US. THIS ENTIRE SERIES IS ALSO AVAILABLE FOR AUDIO DOWNLOAD ABSOLUTELY FREE FROM OUR WEBSITE. WE ALSO WANT TO REMIND YOU OF ANDREW'S LIVING COMMENTARY SOFTWARE. THE LIVING COMMENTARY INCLUDES MORE THAN 50 YEARS OF ANDREW'S BIBLE STUDY NOTES AND PERSONAL ENCOUNTERS WITH GOD. GET ANDREW'S LIVING COMMENTARY TODAY FOR $120. YOU CAN BECOME A GRACE PARTNER THROUGH OUR WEBSITE AT AWMI.NET. YOU CAN ALSO ORDER RESOURCES OR RECEIVE PRAYER BY CALLING OUR HELPLINE AT 719-635-1111. 
Our helpline is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. To write us, use the address on your screen. We appreciate your generosity and hope to hear from you today. Man, before I came to Karis, I was so broken. I dealt a lot with anxiety and depression. I didn't really realize I could have an actual relationship with God. When I came here, I started to see God like, you know, He just wants to have a relationship with me. It totally transformed the way I look at God. God longs to have fellowship with you. This is where faith comes from. It's not just head knowledge, Bible school knowledge, it's revelation knowledge that changes you. Just been set free from a lot of the bondage I was in. I haven't been depressed in so long. Pretty awesome having that just weight lifted and putting on Jesus' yoke. You come here and you meet God personally, and then He gives you a whole new direction. This is a time, this is a season of your life that God's wanting to show you who you really are and what He's wanting to do in your life. If you have a desire for Bible college, God's the one that put it there. If you're considering coming to Karis, I just want to say it's going to be one of the best decisions you've made in your life. I want this ministry to prosper and I want it to go as far as possible. So for me, being a partner is partaking in the blessings as well as giving support to people to tell them that we're behind them and, and we want to be part of what they're doing. It's just awesome to be able to put good seed in good ground. And every blessing of Andrew's we feel and know that it's a blessing of ours. I want to let all of our English-speaking audience know that we are beginning broadcast in Spanish, and I believe that this is going to be a deal-changer for many people. We've had a huge response to the English program, and this is our first time to really be broadcasting in Spanish like this, and we need people to help us. If you would like to help us establish this ministry to the Spanish-speaking world, there will be information on the screen. Join with us and help us start the Spanish-speaking broadcast of the Gospel Truth program. I don't know if you notice, I'm excited about tonight because there is such an expectancy in this place. When you come up here, the environment, the mountains, Women Arise is really special. This conference is awesome. Like you can see the different generations of women here and they're just kind of rising together in worship. It's always so encouraging and getting the word and getting us energized and getting us ready to go to move forward into our next. Why should you come? Why shouldn't you come? Just to be here with your sisters. I think that God does something special when we get together as sisters and just pours out His Spirit over us. Can you give a shout of thanksgiving to the Lord? <laughs> I can't wait for next year. For 20 years, Andrew Womack has been sharing the message of God's unconditional love and grace through his half-hour television program, Monday through Friday. Now, Andrew is broadcasting a full hour-long teaching each week. When God finds somebody who wants to be a giver and wants to bless somebody else, He will give seed to the sower. He will give seed to people who will sow it and give it to other people. Watch the weekend edition of Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack.